This is Distant Replay. Well, today on this mini-sode of Distant Replay, we are going to tell you about a an NFL player that really was a star for a while in the 80s and 90s, more than 90s, but really maybe a, something off the field that you just weren't aware of. And I wasn't. Mike didn't know much about him off the field and, and a lot of the things he got into. And I think a lot of people we've talked to before we did this episode in the course of uh, researching had no idea either. So we want to talk about it on this episode, and it is Dave Meggett. Mike, Dave Meggett, I mean, this is a guy that was a very, very well-known NFL player, and especially a guy that you knew very well because he played for teams that you really followed. Yeah, I, I can't stress enough what Ben just said. I mean, in researching uh, different uh, true crime episodes to do, I came across Dave Meggett's name, and I was blown away uh, by his crimes and by the life he's lived. And the re primary reason I was blown away that I was shocked I hadn't heard about it before because this is a guy who played his professional career with the Giants, the Patriots, and the Jets playing for Bill Parcells at all three stops along that way. And those were good teams. I mean, each stop along his career, he was very much involved on very good teams. And those anywhere Parcells went, those teams were kind of in the limelight. So I think everyone is familiar with the name Dave Meggett, but I bet you not many people know especially during his career and post-career, what he was up to off the field. Well, he's now currently serving a 30-year sentence. So let's tell you how he got there. And Mike, let's begin with his playing career. Yeah, so Dave Mega grew up in North Charleston, South Carolina, which he would eventually end up back there at the end of his, at the end of his uh, reign here. And he's the fifth-round pick of the Giants out of Towson, Towson University, which is in Maryland, in 1989. Right when his rookie year starts, he's playing a huge role on that Super Bowl Giants team, the one where they beat the Bills. We actually did an episode on that Giants-Bills Super Bowl 25, and he played a big role that season because if you remember that team, they had Rodney Hampton and Otis Anderson as the running backs. Rodney Hampton got hurt. Dave Meggett played a big role for that team as like a kick returner, punt returner, and like a third down sort of scat back type player. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a guy like – Think like a small running back, you know, from a small school, kick returner, punt returner, and like all the fans love him because he's like the underdog, the small guy who's, you know, making things happen out on the field. Yeah. An NFL comp from, you know, from recently would probably be like a Darren Sproles if I had to make a comparison. Okay. He plays from 89 to 94 with the Giants. Okay. Then after his stint with the Giants is done, he goes and joins Parcells with the Patriots uh, in 1995. So if you remember, Parcells and the Patriots in 96 went to the Super Bowl where they lost to the Packers. You remember that season, Ben? Yeah, that was a great one. Okay. Well, he had like the best year of his career that year. He had 19, uh, 1,966 all-purpose yards and was a major contributor on that team. He would play from 95 to 97 with the Patriots. We'll get into a little bit later why the Patriots let him go. But he finished his career with Parcells in 1998 with the Jets. And his career came to an abrupt end, which, again, we'll get to why here uh, and something I never knew as we go through sort of uh, his, his career as a criminal. But the Dave Meggett was a solid player, two-time pro bowler, three-time all-pro. And when he retired, he had the most punt return yards in NFL history. So we're not talking hmm. – the reason why I'm surprised I hadn't heard of his criminal activity that we're going to get to – in a second here is we're not talking about a guy who was barely on NFL rosters for 10 years. He was in major media markets contributing. Yeah. I mean, look at this, the highlights for his career. And um, yeah, I didn't realize he had the most punt return yards when he retired or when he was out of the game uh, in NFL history. And, you know, you look at a guy like that and not, not a long career. I mean, what, 10 years or so, uh, a great career, uh, you know, that's a very good NFL career, but you know, a guy that's contributing that much in many facets of the game, you would think would be, in the game longer. So it really takes us to off the field. And this is kind of where when, you know, Mike doing a lot of the research for these true crime episodes <laughs> and are some things that, you know, that are out there, but really have not been talked about hardly at all from, uh, from people in the, in, in the media and just, you know, from NFL fans and you just don't hear about it a ton, but his, his criminal past and his run-ins with the law, they date back quite a, quite a few years, don't they? 
you know, as we go through these crimes, I mean, he, his crime started in 1990 and ended in 2009. So that we know of, first of all, that are on record. And what's going to stand out to you is two things. Number one, how the media coverage has changed over the years. Because if this stuff happened this day and age, we know right away. Mm-hmm. And secondly, the major theme that we see in a lot of these athletes, these true crime episodes we do, is the signs are there that these guys are going to do something very dangerous but they're given chance after chance. Right. So take us back to 1990 where this started. And this, again, this is the very beginning of his, his NFL career. What year two? Yeah. So in 1990, he gets charged with soliciting an officer that was posing as a prostitute in Baltimore. Okay. You know, nothing, nothing violent happens in, in this altercation, but he is arrested for soliciting the officer. He's acquitted on those charges. Okay. Okay. That's in 1990. As we sort of head on here, and again, now this is like right in the middle of his career in 1995, we see the first sort of crime that's made public where he's accused of um, assaulting a female, okay? And this will become a major theme throughout the rest of his his run here. In 1995, he's charged with assaulting his then-girlfriend, okay? But it gets acquitted because the judge says basically that the girlfriend was the aggressor in the situation and that all Megat was doing was using – you know, what they, they called reasonable force to keep her out of the, out of his house, hmm. you know, wow. um, something that, you know, if you take a face value, you may say, okay, I've heard of that happening. But as we get into his, his, what would come in the coming years, you can't help to think that maybe he was given the benefit of the doubt in this situation. Right. It sounds like it. All right. So we fast forward to 1998. So remember this is, this is when he's sort of, uh, you know, at the tail end of his career. And this incident goes a long way into why his career became, you know, came to an abrupt end. In 1998, he was accused of assaulting an escort worker in Toronto during an encounter, um, a sexual encounter with that escort worker. Okay. It's a very graphic incident. Okay. I'm not going to go into the specific details of what he was accused of doing, but you can go read the. SB Nation article by Greg Hanlon titled The Sordid End of Dave Meggett. It goes very deep into his into his crimes, including this one and some others we're going to talk about here in a couple of minutes, and gives a detailed account of, of what he was accused of. But some, you know, just horrible stuff. And yeah. so it goes through a, a two-year process where this is going throughout the legal process. So again, the incident happened in 98. After hearing of the incident, this is what ma- this happens in the offseason in '98. So this is why the Patriots don't bring him back. He was with the Patriots from '95 to '97. The Patriots don't bring him back because, if you remember, do you remember the name Christian Peter? No, I don't remember him at all. Okay, so he was a, a very highly touted Nebraska a defensive line prospect, and he had gotten into an incident in in college where he had basically strangled someone at a bar, a woman. The Patriots drafted him. This was a little bit earlier in the 90s. And they got so much blowback for drafting him that they released him a week after they drafted him. Hmm. Well, that sort of with that in the backdrop, the Patriots are like, we can't have another incident like this, you know, of what Megat is accused of here. We can't have that in the media. So we're just going to release him, right? We're not going to resign him. We're going to release him. So they release him. He plays his last season for the Jets in 1998. I, I didn't read this anywhere, but I think that might have been just like Parcells giving him one last shot yeah. because, again, he played for Parcells with the Giants and with the Patriots. But then after that, you know, while he's going through the legal process with this case, no other teams picked him up after that when he was still a performing player, right? And the thinking is is that there was just too much negative stuff attached to him at this point with all the incidents that he's had up to this point and what he was accused of doing to that escort in Toronto. Do you remember – do you remember at all this time thinking like, why is Dave Meggett out of NFL? And I know you were younger, but you followed it pretty closely. Do you remember anything weird about the end of his career? I don't remember anything weird about it. Um, it's just not so, what the kind of thing I tracked back then. But when you think about it and you go through his stats, he was still a very productive player up until 19, you know, it, through 1998. Right. So uh, when you look back on it, it does make sense that this was the reason why you know, these were the reasons why maybe teams didn't bring him in. It's not of an unspoken thing like, you know, we can't have this guy attached to the league because of the things he's accused of doing. And in 2000, that case in Toronto ends in a hung jury. So again, 
you have an incident where he's accused of doing something pretty horrific, but he gets away with it. Okay. Right. And post career for Megat, by all accounts, was a very stressful time for him. He lost nearly all of his $10 million he earned as a player to back child support um, because he is the father to nine children. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah, uh, nine children. He even had, he's one of these guys who had to sell his Super Bowl ring to make money. You know what I mean? Right. Which I always thought on a side tangent was like kind of weird why someone would want to buy someone else's Super Bowl ring when they didn't earn it. But memorabilia. You know, yeah, yeah. We'll leave that for discussion for another day. But so he's going through all this post career, losing all of his money, owing back because of owing back child support, selling a Super Bowl ring. He ends up in North Carolina and becomes the, the park, a park and rec director uh, in the town of Robersonville, North Carolina. All right. I didn't get much information on how he ended up there, but he had, was forced to resign in 2006 after he was accused of sexually assaulting his former girlfriend. So again, another incident of sexual assault that he's accused of. Jeez. He ends up getting convicted of misdemeanor sexual battery in this case and gets two years probation. But then the worst part of this is they allow him to move to South Carolina, where he's from, to serve as probation. Man, well, I'm sure it was like, hey, yeah, you can go move out of our state. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seemed like North exactly. It seemed like North Carolina passing their problem onto South Carolina. Yeah. So now remember, this was in 2006. Very shortly after his move to South Carolina, he's ramping up these sexual crimes even more. He's accused very soon after moving to South Carolina of sexually assaulting another girl, a 17-year-old, but prosecutors decide to not press charges against Dave Meggett because they have questions about um, the victim's credibility. That seems to be a running theme here. It, the running theme seems to be, exactly. This guy is getting away with this. You know, we're starting where in 1995 he was getting away with this, and it's still happening into 2007, and I can't help to think he's emboldened by this, right? I mean, he probably feels like, um, he's invisible at this point where yeah. there's a pretty good track record of him at best smacking women around a little bit, which is terrible in its own right. And at worst being like an outright serial rapist. Yeah. He's definitely you know? in some questionable situations, you know, regardless of the outcome of those, those trials. And just keep in mind, he's 40 years old at this time when this, uh, these accusations against with this 17 year old happen. Yeah. That, that's good. That's good to kind of put a, put a pin in it there, Ben. He is, it's a 40 year old guy we're talking about. And this kind of all leads us to the incident in 2009, which he's the one he's currently in jail for now. Okay. So after getting away with this terrible behavior for nearly 20 years, it leads to him being in a bar in 2009 in his hometown of Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Again, this story is in detail in that article I mentioned from SB Nation, the sordid end of Dave Meggett. But he met, he met a girl at a bar. They were hanging out and... As the story goes, he drugged her while they were hanging out, you know, slipped something in her drink that made her feel uh, disoriented and basically would drag her out of the bar when she was feeling like the full effects of being dizzy or whatnot um, from, from her drink being spiked. And he would then bring her to his car and proceed to rape her. Okay. Obviously a terrible, it gets even more graphic than that if you read the article which i'm not going to get into here if you want to read a little bit more about that you can check out the article if this story can get any crazier he drugs her he rapes her in his car while the car was moving the girl had the presence of mind to unlock the door and escape from the car while it was moving oh wow geez yeah just crazy stuff here and and, and Thankfully, the authorities went right to the bar after she, you know, she made her way to the police station. They went right to the bar and questioned people. People identified Maggot as the man who left the bar with her. They put two and two together pretty quickly. And this is ultimately what he was convicted of, rape and robbery, and he's in jail for 30 years. So, you know, again, it starts innocently with soliciting a prostitute and not innocently, but it starts unassumingly in 1990 with soliciting a prostitute mm -hmm. and it ends in 2009 with him going to jail for 30 years for rape and again no no one really stepping in and making a difference in the interim and, and putting a stop to this before it gets to this point yeah definitely had these predatory habits for uh, a number of years and you know you hate to see how it all turned out and and how maybe 
you know, these, these last few victims could have, uh, could have avoided the situation had things played out differently early on, but, um, really a horrible story. I, I didn't have, again, I had no idea this was the case with Dave Meggett. I mean, when you say his name, I mean, I just think about the first thing I think about before today in this episode was, you know, that, that 1990 Super Bowl we talked about in the past episode and just kind of think of him as, as a solid NFL player. Don't really know much about him beyond that. So this is all very surprising to learn. Yeah, I was shocked when I read this. I mean, up until yesterday, when I thought of Dave Meggett, I thought of like a really good third down scat back who could return kicks and punts. That's really where my thoughts of Dave Meggett started and ended and just totally taken aback by uh, um, by sort of his life of crimes. And again, just some of the major themes that we see in these different episodes with these guys getting away with a lot because of who they are and their status in their communities where they, it always seems like these guys end up where they grow up, doesn't it? Yeah, they definitely go back because to their that's home. where they have the most influence. It's oh, it's Dave Meggett, the, the high school football star. Right. It, they don't think of him as or Arch Leister. Oh, the Ohio State quarterback. You know, he's back. He's back living at home. You know, it, they don't think of him first as you know Dave Meggett, serial predator, which yeah. is what he is. Did you even know he was in jail? I had no. I had no clue. Yeah. None. Yeah, it seems like you know that was only 2009, so it hadn't been that long ago, and there's probably media coverage of it. But again, it's, it doesn't seem like a story that was treated in a similar way to many sexual assault cases we see today. And, and the fact that it wasn't all over the news and, you know, the guy in 2009, he was still only, you know, 10 years removed from playing. So it wasn't like he was some washed up NFL player that had been long been forgotten. I mean, this is a guy that's still not that far removed from playing in the NFL. So pretty crazy to, to hear this uh, completely, Mike. And you know, you know, what was surprising too, Ben, is that in a situation like this, there's no like YouTube documentary on him. There's nothing. There's really nothing of, of substance except for this article I keep on referencing by Greg Hanlon uh, from SB Nation. Yeah. Again, remind us the name of that in case somebody wants to go back and read that. It's called The Sordid, The Sordid End of Dave Meggett. And it goes into all the details you need to know about you know, if you're, if you want to get into specifics on, on, on exactly what he did to these women. And it's, it's, not an easy read, to be honest, but it gives a good rundown. Ah, so another mini sode of Distant Replay in the books and an eye-opening one as well. True crime, it's, you know, it's always intriguing to go back to, but you forget and or don't really think about there's somebody on the other end of those crimes that were committed. So really horrible to hear this one, um, but interesting to learn about along the way and being more aware of, of actually who Dave Meggett was and, and think about him a lot differently moving forward. So if you have anything you want us to kind of get to a moment, uh, a true crime uh, person or whoever, an incident, send it to us. We'd love to hear from you. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and online at distantreplaypodcast.com.